I went for this initial meeting, which was with the, I think it was with uh, the, uh, the head teacher of the college. Um, we sat down and he went through my grades and he just said that I, I wasn't clever enough. I, I wasn't clever enough to do A-level maths or physics. Um, and I remember walking out of that meeting and, and crying with my parents because uh, I had this clear vision of where I wanted to go and it wasn't going to happen. Um, I told my nan that I was going to buy a Porsche to take her to the shops in and that uh, I was going to work in Formula One. Um, and this kind of broke the path. There wasn't, I didn't see how, how would I get from where I was to where I needed to be. I'm James Hill and I'm a calibration engineer and ex F1 data analysis. <laughs> My parents, were, they'd, uh, they'd give me toys, but they, they would reluctantly do it because toys got taken apart. That's what would happen. <laughs> they'd give me nice things and I would make them into their component pieces. Some went back together, generally not the right way, but um, yeah, right from a very early age, it was, uh, that was how I worked. Nan and Grandad, they had a, a, a VHS of uh, the 1986 Group B Rally Review. And I would just watch that thing until it was worn out, <laughs> just on a loop. But that was that kind of age, definitely, yeah, from a very young age. They went in engineering. My dad was in IT. Um, he liked cars, but it, there wasn't the hands-on thing going on. And the same with my mum's side, there wasn't really any hands-on stuff. Um, but they, I think they realised that that's what I did and what I really enjoyed, and they cultivated that. They put a lot of effort in and, uh, and helped me along the way. We moved to the area and I had a, uh, a, a car went past on a trailer and um, we noticed it, it looked like a, a, a bullet really. It was this small kind of, I don't know, uh, two metres long, something like that. And the uh, next time it went past, we flagged it down and it turned out to be a uh, a father and his son uh, and daughter and uh, another family or another couple of families and um, it was part of the Shell Helix, Helix mileage marathon and I was only a, a school kid at that age um, and they were doing this project just between the families on a farm near where we are now uh, and I started joining in with that and it, uh, it escalated to the point where we, we, were built, we built three cars, um, the one which I worked on did 3,000 miles to the gallon and we built everything on the car. Um, the only bits we didn't make were the piston, the comrod and the crankshaft. And, uh, but that was through encouragement through the, the adults again, because none of us wanted to write letters. <laughs> Nobody wants to write letters anymore, but um, they were all handwritten. And yeah, the, that was part of the, the deal was, they said that you are much more likely to get uh, engagement if as a, uh, as a school, a uh, school age child write handwriting letters puts effort into it and then they're more likely to give effort back and that's that's something key which I le I've learned all the way through and that they've taught me wow. that put effort in you will get rewards back yeah they they again they were all engineers whereas my dad wasn't so they worked in classic car restoration or vintage car restoration um, one of the, the, the guy whose farm it was, he uh, has an engineering company um, and uh, he had a load of vintage cars as well, which he would work on some really crazy stuff, um, which just, yeah, got my mind fired up. The uh, design of technology, great, fantastic. I built a bike out of um, Kevlar for my uh, <laughs> for my uh, my D T project for GCSE, and uh, got an A star for that. Rubbish and everything else. <laughs> I think I managed to uh, maybe a C in maths, and and that was about it. It was like a D in English, and really not very much going on. But I needed something which would get me fired up to actually make the most of my 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 passion and my skills. I certainly knew that I was quite lucky. I also was very frustrated because I couldn't understand why school wasn't, uh, it wasn't tailored for me. It was just this kind of broad encompassing thing for all kids, which is the right thing to do, I see now, but I certainly didn't feel like I was getting the most out of school. I didn't feel like uh, I was understood particularly. <laughs> I 
remember being extremely disappointed. I, I remember crying when I was told I wasn't allowed to do A-levels because that broke my this clear path ahead that I had, which I wanted to, uh, I said that I was going to work for Gordon Murray. Um, I told my nan that I was going to buy a Porsche to take her to the shops in and that uh, I was going to work in Formula One. Um, and this kind of broke the path. There wasn't, I didn't see how, how would I get from where I was to where I needed to be. I went for this initial meeting, which was with the, I think it was with the, the, uh, the head teacher of the college. Um, we sat down and he went through my grades and he just said that I, I wasn't clever enough. I, I there wasn't clever enough to do A-level maths or physics. Um, and I remember walking out of that meeting and, and crying with my parents because uh, I had this clear vision of where I wanted to go and it wasn't going to happen. Subsequently, we, my parents had a look around and things and I did as well and realised that I could do this BTEC in engineering. And actually, as soon as I realised what that entailed, it seemed like that's, that's what I should be doing anyway. This makes so much more sense. Um, and I worked uh, through that for two years and, uh, and met my work now wife there as well. Uh, and um, yeah, it was good, it was good. I had some great lecturers and learnt a lot of very, very useful things. Very useful. Far more applied. I, I did quite a lot of stuff outside of class as well as at, uh, at college as well. So I managed to get a job at a uh, a classic car restoration uh, garage that did racing cars, and I got to travel around the circuits and things with them at weekends. So that was that was really hard work because that was a long days, a lot of hours, and not getting paid very much. Yeah. I still had a view to go to university, okay. and I still knew that I I would need that advanced education to to gain entry into F1 where I wanted to be. You can, you can, I know that you can get in um, as, a, as a tech or a mechanic, but I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be um, working out how to make the cars go faster, yeah. not being the person who fits the parts to make sure that the car's working, if that makes sense. Um, uh, because that's the side that I really enjoy. Um, and there was only one real route to doing that. You, you, you can climb the ladder, but it takes a very long time and uh, F1's a bit of a brutal environment. I got an interview at Williams F1 for their wind tunnel and I went. To, I turned up late at the, for the interview because it was uh, like an exam, a SAT exam that they had for the first bit. Turned up late, uh, then proceeded to get the engineer who was taking the interview to carry all my stuff in because I was using grudges. Uh, and surprisingly, I didn't get that job. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've learned so much from him. Um, he's not a degree qualified engineer, but he's a natural engineer and he uh, is completely self-taught um, uh, and I, I will always appreciate working with him. Uh, crikey, it was in mid-afternoon about five o'clock and he popped his nose and how are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm all right, you know, I had the engine out, I had the gearbox out and I had it all in bits and stuff and he looked over it and he, uh, he was like, okay, yeah, no worries. Let me know how you get on this pit. And I was like, ah, I'm not getting anywhere with this. And later on, about eight or nine o'clock at night, he came back past and he was in his scrubs and he came in and he started working on it with me. And he was like, you've, you've been working on it for hours. You've clearly put a lot of effort in and you haven't got the skills that you need. Um, but he wanted to help me because I tried to help myself. And that's something which I've tried to carry forwards is I need to make sure that I'm helping myself before I go to other people to ask for help. Because you don't, uh, I don't think you, you learn properly without doing that. I found it hard that there wasn't a physical output for me. It was too far detached. I couldn't see what I was doing. And I need that. I need to have that, uh, that, um, that reward. Um, and I just didn't get it. We were designing parts and they'd be sent off to manufacturers and then, then they'd come back and somebody else would fit them.
they sent through the contracts and the day they sent through the contracts I got a call from Cosworth they said can you come down for an interview I think it was even like the next day or something that it happened uh, so I went down for an interview and it was a uh, an interesting process I was interviewed by a guy called Ben Hoyle uh, who had previously been at ProDrive interestingly um, and he was the interview process was really hands-on um, he was giving me um, uh, like graphs and things to look at and so what what have you got there tell me what you can see tell me what what can you learn from that um, and I did my best again I, at that point I was winging it because I'd, I've never come into contact with any of this stuff but I could I could see what was on there I could see the numbers and I could kind of deduce from that what I needed uh, partially what we needed um, and I went home not expecting much because I know that I, I got made quite a few mistakes and he corrected me quite a few times and I think it was even later that day they called me up and said Do you want a job and so I had to call up Bentley and uh, rescind my verbal offer and send their contract back and uh, they've actually never forgiven me for that. <laughs> uh, and it turns out they're quite funny like that. So that's quite interesting. I, I accidentally burnt those bridges. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was, that was, the, that was the, the tip of a very big iceberg. <laughs> I managed to get the job and it immediately uh, just went completely bonkers because I've, I've been used to doing you know my, my normal uh, eight nine hour days uh, five days a week um, and I mean it was unusual because I was still I was out on bikes and things and I was traveling to test facilities and things like test tracks and um, but it then I turned up and then I had uh, like a week and we had to travel to uh, to Spain for the first test and it was just like deep end I've got no idea what I'm doing here absolutely no idea this is a, a a paradigm shift from where I was. And so you've got the, the big screens that you, I don't know if you've ever watched F1 with the big screens with the guys that sit in front and they sit, well, they've got like six, eight screens. Um, and I, I was one of those guys. Suddenly I went from, you know, being a, a Cal engineer, a, a, a manufacturer, to being one of those people you see on TV with the headphones on and the boom mic and people talking to me in the radio and things and looking at all this, this data, it was mad, it was mad. Um, and again, Cosworth expected a lot, they expected a lot. Uh, it was a, a very steep learning curve, very steep, steeper than any other job that I'd ever had because you were dumped in at the deep end. Uh, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And suddenly I was spending weeks away from home um, and I'd get home and I was shattered because we would be doing 14, 16, 18 hour days. At tests, we, we would have 24, 30 hour stretches where we wouldn't go back to the uh, hotel um, and you were there, you'd work through the night. Because the thing is, it's not just what you see with the cars on track. Um, if you ever want to start the cars, the engineers have to be there to monitor them. And but during testing, you just it's fraught with problems and the, you're there, you're expected to provide solutions. And one of the things I really got on with in F1 was the fact that the deadlines, unlike manufacturer deadlines where you are, you're talking weeks, months, years even, the deadlines are in 15 minutes time. And it's like, here's a problem, fix it. <laughs> Frantic tapping on the keyboard trying to work out what's going on. Uh, and and you, you'd come up with a solution, any solution, um, and feed that back. And then that's it, that's, that's that deadline gone. Bang, another one turns up. You've got 15 minutes again. But it was, the, the stress and the pressure was so short. And I loved that because I'd have these, these peaks of intense uh, activity and in, intense uh, uh, brain function, followed by a complete switch off. And then it would peak again and it would drop, which is great because I've got a very short attention span. I'm, I'm like a six-year-old. <laughs> and it was perfect for me. I realized a lot about myself. Um, that uh, I think I had become a bit too arrogant by that point because I had um, I've moved I've, what I felt was like quite quickly for my age. I've gone from working with uh, some guys who'd been working their jobs for, for years and years to working at what is effectively the pinnacle of uh, uh, vehicular engineering uh, uh, with some of the best engineers in the world.
uh, my um, gung-ho attitude had to change a bit quite rapidly uh, and I very quickly learned to, to um, uh, keep my mouth shut and appear stupid rather than open it. <laughs> That's the best way. Yeah, don't say anything. Listen. And, and uh, I, that helped me progress again, start to move much more quickly. You get up, uh, you go to the track as soon as you got up, you, you'd be in the van by 5.30, 6am. Uh, you'd have breakfast at the track, you'd have lunch at the track, you'd have dinner at the track, you would work straight through. Um, we did have curfew, so you weren't allowed to spend any more than 18 hours a day at the circuit. Um, you'd have to clock in and clock out. And as soon as you, uh, you travel with the team, you are effectively on call 24-7. There's no, there is no downtime really. 12 hours a day for, for seven days effectively because with, with set up and set down and, and the, the comings and goings, you, you, you work generally uh, 12, yeah. 12 to 14 hours a day, I reckon. So you're talking uh, 80 to 100 hours yeah. per race. And sometimes you'd have back to back, so you in a two yeah. week stretch you'd work, you know, 180 hours, something like that. That's crazy. Yes, yeah, bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> the racks that we'd have would have multiple um, screens running, all sorts of different um, uh, data inputs that you could check, and you'd have like a like a main screen which would give you some real salient points and that you could see where problems might be starting to, to uh, manifest themselves. And then if you saw you had a problem, you'd then be able to use alternate screens to bring up that data in detail, uh, the surrounding parameters that were contained within that. Um, and that, that would be two hours of just this crazy intense uh, um, effort. You couldn't move. You were sat in a chair like this at a screen for, for two hours. I've been present when engines have been lost. Uh, when other people have not been so sympathetic um, uh, and uh, we've lost £200,000 engines. Uh, there was a really simple one. We moved an engine off of the, uh, off the back of the car and moved it onto its stand, but the stand hadn't been cleaned fully and it got put down and went pop. And I think it was a nut, it just went straight through the sump and that wrote the engine off, which was £250,000. <laughs> we, we chopped an engine in half on the dyno and it locked a camshaft up, uh, snapped the crankshaft in the process and the rods and the pistons, they, well, the rods span round and it basically chopped the engine in half, <laughs> which is quite dramatic. <laughs> Did you see it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's quite hairy when that kind of stuff happens. Wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, things, do, things do break. And as I said, I mean, it's all part, part and parcel of the job, really. We're, we're required to, to understand how things break, when they break, what we can do to fix them. Used to cause some interesting issues. I remember one of the guys getting a stomach upset and having to um, uh, making a decision between uh, uh, having a uh, an incident <laughs> while sat in his chair or deciding to leave his computer. And uh, fortunately, one of the the managers stepped in for him, so he didn't shit himself. Which is <laughs> which is probably for the best. But this is how how far the the engineers would go. You get to the point where you would get yourself into some possibly very embarrassing situations in pursuit of making sure that you were doing your job because uh, a huge amount was expected of you. You'll find that the pit crew is out doing circuit runs. I, I ran every circuit, um, nearly every circuit, there was a couple I didn't want to, um, but nearly every circuit we, we run a lap at least if not two. Or it was quite, we, had, we were at uh, Suzuka in Japan and uh, they, it, was, it was dark because it was towards the end of the season. They switched the lights off halfway around and it was pitch black. Um, I was surprised because Jensen Bunt overtook me at that point. Um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they'll be out with the team, they'll be doing different exercises. They, they do like um, fireman carry shuttle runs and stuff like that. They'll pick each other up and run uh, like, you know, the 20 metre sprint, put them down. The other guy picks him up, sprint back. Um, to to make sure that they are fit enough to do what they need to do. I was out of the country for 186 days in a year. Um, I did 100 147,000 miles on aeroplanes in a year. Uh, uh, I, was in the, I was in the air for 10 full straight days. <laughs> We'd go to tracks, you'd fly there, generally, and you would generally get the day that you arrived 
off. So we didn't get weekends. Um, I think I've worked out, I had 20, 20 something days off in a year, including weekends. It was ridiculous. But that day we arrived at the track, you'd have off. So if you arrived at four o'clock in the afternoon or whether you, you arrived at 10 o'clock, you'd have that day off. And uh, I got very good at speed tourism. I took my running stuff everywhere and had my camera and I would run around wherever we were and see everything that I could. <laughs> it was great, it was great. So I've, I've visited a lot of uh, interesting places at speed. There's lots of selfies, quick, run, run, run. It was good, it was good. Uh, Tokyo is probably my favorite when we went to, oh, well, Singapore or Tokyo. Yeah, Tokyo was amazing, it was amazing. But it was good, it was good, and I was learning a lot, and also just working with some of the most incredible machines in the world. You know, engines that can do 20,000 RPM and, and make nearly 800 horsepower from a 2.4 litre engine without a turbo. It's just, they were just bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Um, and that's, that's inspirational for me. It gave me drive to do what I was doing, it was important. Thank you.